Welcome to EPG Patshala. This particular module is going to be about Eugene O'Neill's play First. I am Niladri Chatterjee, Professor, Department of English, University of Kalyani, West Bengal. One of the first things that you should know about Eugene O'Neill before you start reading his plays is that his plays are classical. Now what do I mean by that? What I basically mean is that there is a certain simplicity in his plays. Simplicity uh, on the level of plot. Simplicity at the level of the number of characters. There aren't, there aren't too many characters in his plays. So therefore, there is a certain simplicity in the overall construction of the play. So, if you are going to be interested in the plays of Eugene O'Neill for their plot, then I don't think that would be a very good idea because the plot of the play is not of great importance. What is important in Eugene O'Neill's theatre is the way in which the plot is created to carry out an investigation into the psyche of the few characters that are there in his plays. Now the reason why there are so few characters in his plays, that also perhaps needs a little bit of explanation. There are few characters in his plays because clearly he wishes to develop those characters and he wishes to explore those characters in greater depth. If he had more characters in his plays, then perhaps he would not be able to develop them as he would want to. So when we think about Eugene O'Neill's plays as molded on, on a classical structure, we should also keep in mind that in some of his plays, most importantly in Morning Becomes Electra, there is also a revisiting of classical theatre, of classical mythology that he undertakes. So when we are looking at Eugene O'Neill, remember that although he is an American playwright, but he is also very strongly influenced by a certain European uh, tradition of narrative and also by a certain European notion of theatre. We now go on to discussing the play. Eugene Gladstone O'Neill was born on the 16th of October 1888 and he died on 27th November 1953. He was born to James O'Neill and Della. His father was an accomplished touring actor. Thus very early in life he was exposed to the theatre world and this is something that attracted him greatly. He was sent to boarding schools at St. Vincent and Betts Academy in Stamford. O.G. Eugene O'Neill's journey as a playwright began in 1916 in the village of Provincetown, Massachusetts. Here, a group of young writers and painters launched an experimental theatre group called the Playwrights Theatre. And they produced Eugene O'Neill's first play, Bound East for Cardiff. Cardiff, as you may be aware, is a place in Wales, in the United Kingdom. Initially, O'Neill was writing fairly melodramatic plays. Now, what do I mean by melodramatic plays? Melodramatic plays are those plays in which the characters speak in a very affected tone. They speak in a way in which we don't normally talk when we are carrying on with our lives. Um, the emotions, the passions are yanked up to a higher pitch, by which I mean that they usually speak in a way or emote in a way that is extremely dramatic. And so therefore he was writing these melodramatic plays um, in which the characters were speaking in a way in which we normally don't talk. In American literary scenario till that time, um, there were several subjects that had not yet been broached. Uh, and one of the subjects was, of course, uh, the way in which Eugene O'Neill was tackling the subject of tragedy. And gradually audiences appreciated his plays and the Playwrights Theatre began to attract greater audiences. His play Beyond the Horizon, which was written in 1918, established him as a renowned playwright and brought him his first Pulitzer Prize. His other important works are Anna Christie, Strange Interlude and Long Day's Journey into Night. They also received Pulitzer Prizes. In the next few decades, 
O'Neill became one of the most translated playwrights after Shakespeare and George Bernard Shaw. When he died in 27, on 27th November 1953, his last words were, I knew it, I knew it, born in a hotel room, died in a hotel room. Now, I am not going to go through the entire list of Eugene O'Neill's plays because there are so many of them. I would simply want you to, uh, for example, take a look at some plays. Desire Under the Elms, I think, is a play that you should certainly look at. Morning Becomes Electra is a play that you should certainly look at. The Iceman Cometh is a play that is also worthy of attention. A Moon for the Misbegotten is also worthy of your attention. So these are some of the plays, but of course he wrote many, many others. Uh, but these are the plays that are normally regarded as being the most representative of Eugene O'Neill's theatre. What is exactly the style of Eugene O'Neill? And if I have to talk about the style of Eugene O'Neill, then therefore I think I would have to mention the fact that he is particularly interested in stage directions. His stage directions are set out in great detail. In this, I would want you to also think about a playwright like George Bernard Shaw, because if you look at George Bernard Shaw's plays, you will find that the stage directions are extremely particular. They are very, very accurate, because George Bernard Shaw had certain very fixed notions about the way in which his plays should be performed. So he left nothing to chance when it, came, when it came to setting down the stage directions. With Eugene O'Neill, it's also the same. And this particular emphasis on precision and detailing also certainly affects his characters because the characters then become lifelike, the characters become credible, and that is something which we appreciate in Eugene O'Neill's plays. However, it is difficult to define his style because, as, uh, as one of the critics said, at different times and sometimes within the same framework, he is a naturalist, a romanticist, an impressionist, a symbolist, an expressionist, often bordering on the surreal. He is an empiricist and a psychoanalyst. Now, these are several, if he can just sort of stay there for some time and if we can look at the way in which he has been differently characterized. Let me go through this one by one. He is a naturalist. What is meant by that? By which it is meant that he is there to represent life as he saw it. A romanticist. There are certain ideals that he has, certain romantic ideals that he has about mankind, about society, that, uh, that these ideals are being represented in his theatre. He is an impressionist. What does that mean? It means that he is looking at society and he is simply forming an impression of the society, which may not be the accurate picture, but this is his impression. He is also called a symbolist. Who is a symbolist? A symbolist is somebody who uses um, certain important repetitive symbols to make a particular point. He is an expressionist by which is meant that he is simply expressing what is on his mind uh, and sometimes that expression may not have any clear link with reality. He is also bordering on the surreal. What is surreal? Surreal is that which is over the real, by which is meant that sometimes a surreal representation, well not sometimes, always, a surreal representation is that representation which looks it, it consists of elements that are drawn from reality, but the overall impression is of something that is completely unreal. It is completely unreal. And for here, uh, as an example, I would certainly want you to look at, for example, the paintings of Salvador Dali. Because in Salvador Dali's paintings, you are going to see exactly how surrealism operates. There are going to be several elements in those paintings that are going to look familiar to you. But the way in which Dali uses them, them, you would not be able to find such scenes in your day-to-day -day life ever. He is also an empiricist by which is meant that he bases his plays on reality. He places, he places his plays also on what is available, what is tangible. He is not interested in spirituality. He is, he is much more interested in what is empirically uh, accessible, that is to say everything that we can apprehend 
everything that we can comprehend with our senses. He is also regarded as a psychoanalyst because he is very interested in the characters and also in the psychology of the characters of his plays. The play The Thirst was written in 1913 when Eugene O'Neill was living in New London in Connecticut. O'Neill wrote The Thirst at the same time that he wrote two other plays based on shipwreck. Now in writing this play based on a shipwreck and some of the other plays as well, O'Neill was partially influenced, one may say, by the traumatic sinking of the Titanic that took place in 1912. So there is some kind of a real life incident which actually inspired him to write this play. As in his other plays, in Thirst, O'Neill has made an ample use, or he has made ample use of the sea roving experiences throughout the work for atmospheric and structural symbolism. The loneliness and smallness of man uh, in, in the vast unsympathetic universe is suggested poignantly in the very beginning uh, and also at the closing of the play which have an almost existential bearing. Now those of you who are not familiar with the existentialist school, this is a this is a certain school of philosophy that was developed in France according to which man is lonely, man does not have an identity, um, actually, I shouldn't say man, I should say human. The human being is lonely. The human being does not have an identity. The human being's identity is only created by what the human being does. So therefore, existentialism basically believes that you do not exist. You only start to exist when you act. So therefore, there is nothing that is uh, sort of innate to you. That is something, there is nothing that is innate to you. Everything that you do goes towards making your identity. The play opens with an image of stasis and frozen time. The sun burns motionlessly overhead, the surface of the glassy sea is still, the sharks encircle the undulating raft, giving an impression of a near motionlessness of the eye. Now the stasis is concretized more at the end. Um, so what does stasis mean? Stasis, stasis means a state um, of motionlessness, that is to say everything is still, everything is quiet. That is what is meant. So therefore, the play opens with everything being quiet. But of course, you must understand that just because everything is quiet does not necessarily mean that everything is okay. Because as you can see that everything is not okay, um, there are three characters in a raft, there has just been a shipwreck. So there are these three people who have somehow managed to survive the shipwreck. They are on a raft. But remember that there are also um, sharks that, that are circling the raft. So therefore the sharks are waiting to eat these three survivors of the shipwreck. So here we are actually faced with the imminent demise, the imminent death um, of these three human beings who find themselves on a raft. Now who are these three human beings? One is a gentleman. He represents high class white society. The second is a dancer. She is a dancer by profession and represents the love for finery and beauty and of life. Um, she is more or less materialistic as she thinks of her belongings. And there is a West Indian mulatto, sailor. The sailor represents the non-white world. Now before I continue any further, who is a mulatto? A mulatto is somebody who is perhaps, um, he, his racial origins are mixed. So that is what a mulatto broadly is defined as, his racial origins are mixed. The play opens with a scene where the three survivors of a shipwreck, that is to say the gentleman, the dancer and the sailor, they are on a raft. The gentleman is in his formal evening dress that is now tattered due to shipwreck and the dancer who is in a short skirt um, it's basically her costume with black a costume of black velvet covered with spangles. Spangles are basically uh, bright, shiny materials that are used to decorate the skirt. The third, of course, as you very well know by now, is the West Indian mulatto who is the sailor. Now the sailor opens the play with his monotonous song and his eyes are following the shark fins that have been circling the raft and uh, it looks as though the circling of the raft will continue for some time till the sharks actually have something 
tweet. The dancer is sobbing, she's crying. In brief, in the blistering heat, they are without water, they're without food, and they're surrounded by sharks, and there is nobody to rescue them. The rest of the play presents the conversation that takes place between these three, amongst these three characters. However, most, most part of the play, one can see that the conversation happens only between the gentleman and the dancer. Occasionally, the sailor speaks. So, we are looking at um, the way in which um, we have three human beings who are bound by uh, the sea, by the water on all sides. They have no food, they have no water and they are in the danger of being eaten alive by the shark. The only lines the sailor speaks are, I have no water and I do not know. The conversation between the gentleman and the dancer reveals how they came to be on the raft. Now, the gentleman and the dancer, they both believe that the sailor is hiding water, but the sailor denies it. On the advice of the gentleman, and in desperation to get water, the dancer first offers a diamond necklace to the sailor. However, when he rejects, she then offers herself to him. In a fit of delusion, she imagines herself performing on a stage and she dances uncontrollably. Now you can imagine that she hasn't had anything to drink, she has had no food to eat, so therefore the dancer dies while dancing due to heat and thirst. Now the sailor sees this as a rather wonderful turn of events. He brings out his knife and he's now singing a happy Negro song that says, we shall eat, we shall drink. Um, so therefore we can see that the sailor wishes to cut up the dead body of the dancer and eat the body of the dancer. The gentleman, however, is in absolute horror and he obviously is not going to allow the dancer's body to be cut up and eaten, so therefore he pushes the dancer's body into the water. The sailor, in anger, stabs him in his breast and falls into the water. As he falls, he holds the sailor's collar and pulls him along and falls into the water and they both die. So look at the way in which the play ends with all the three characters dying and they die because they all fall into the sea so therefore ultimately they do become the food of the sharks. Now that I think is something which we really need to take some time to understand. This is clearly not a comedy. This is a tragedy in which three people who have been trying to survive ultimately don't survive. So this is a tragedy and this is also a tragedy in the sense that what every tragedy is going to always tell you is that human beings are powerless in the face of fate. Ultimately human beings are powerless, ultimately human beings cannot change the destiny and ultimately human beings are no matter how powerful they think they are, they are not. So there is a kind of a helplessness uh, that, is that is characteristic of tragedies. There is almost in every tragedy you know that at the end there is a terrible event that is awaiting you. The doom is awaiting you and yet you cannot help it. You gradually move towards that doom knowing full well that the doom is terrible and the doom is unavoidable. Now, O'Neill had a tragic vision, especially in his earlier plays. He dealt with it. And, of course, the thirst, one can see that there are these three characters, unnamed, gentleman, dancer, sailor, uh, and these three are stranded in mid-ocean. Now, through these characters' agonies, problems, failure of their hopes, O'Neill highlights the loneliness of human beings in this enormous, cruel world in which there is no security, where there are no permanent relationships, where the moment you die, somebody can come and, uh, and can basically eat you. Um, irony of life that stands against human progress and the hidden wicked and animal instincts of the civilized race. Remember that this is not the first time, of course, that um, anybody has come across this idea. We are going to see this um, idea also developed um, in England, for example, if you look at the novel um, if you look at the novel by William Golding called The Lord of Flies, in which a group of schoolboys find themselves uh, on, on an island after their ship 
is wrecked and you, we can see in the lord of the flies how once these boys are left on an island gradually their animal instincts come to the fore so we now go on to the major themes. Well, the loneliness, of course, is highlighted by the presence of the glaring sun, like the great angry eye of God, pitiless clear sky, the scorching heat waves, the madness of silence and hungry red ocean. So what does this mean? It means that clearly Eugene O'Neill is trying to represent um, a world in which there is no security, where there is no succor, you cannot pray, you cannot turn to God, ultimately your end is going to be what it is going to be and nobody will be there to save you. So it is a very dark vision that is being um, communicated through the play. It is melodramatic in the sense that obviously um, uh, the characters behave in a way in which we normally don't behave but then how do you know how we behave because when we are faced in a situation where we either have to live or we have to die then we are certainly going to do everything in our power to make sure that we live even if it means eating another fellow human being and there have been several stories for example of people who have eaten the bodies of their uh, companions when it came to the point where they couldn't live without food anymore so of course it is a melodramatic play but it also have a it also has a deep-seated mental agony but at the surface level it just appears to be a very crude representation uh, of reality but the play also presents the irony of human life in the sense that we pretend to be loving we pretend to be caring but ultimately that is not the way in which we uh, um, behave when we are faced with a situation of great crisis their past lives haunt them, especially the ironies of their lives, um, is, is of a great concern and they talk about it very often. And we also see that the sailor, who was feeling elated at the sight of the dancer's body, thinking to quench his thirst and hunger, uh, but the sailor also becomes uh, food for the sharks. The only thing that remains on the raft is the glittering diamond necklace of the dancer, uh, which brings to the fore the irony and helplessness of human condition and to say that ultimately the diamond necklace counts for nothing. It is completely valueless because it does not save the life of anyone. It is of no use whatsoever. The fact that human nature um, also carries within itself a core of bestiality is something that we have repeatedly witnessed in our own civilization, in our own society. And this is something that O'Neill is, of course, not only protesting against, but he's also drawing our attention to it. He revolts against such traditional representations uh, by showing that the sailor sharpening his knife to eat the dancer's body, um, uh, you know. But he is also, through this, O'Neill shakes his audiences and leaves them to realize the futility of existence but not only the futility of existence also we are made to realize that under the veneer of our sophistication under the veneer of, of our um, knowledge and erudition and, and learning we are still basically primal people who when our existence is threatened we are not going to stop at anything to ensure that we survive so the survival instinct of the human being is something that Eugene O'Neill clearly wants to draw our attention to. Let us look at the sailor, for example. The sailor is the most living of all the three characters presented. He's, he basically represents the characteristic feature of savagery uh, and of the civilized human, but he's also the most human because he is somebody who actually behaves in the way in which anybody would when they are hungry and thirsty. He tries to adjust to the situation and to survive as long as possible. He also remains um, quiet and he also saves his valuable energy. His keeping quiet enhances the mystery of his intentions. Um, in contrast to the sailor, um, there, is of course, there are of course the gentleman and the dancer who experience visual hallucinations of an island and a tumbler full of water. So the sailor remains very, very quiet. He does not speak much, but ultimately even he becomes desperate to eat. 
O'Neill does not want the audience to harbor ill feelings towards the sailor. His sailor represents an idea, as do the gentleman and the dancer. Of course, the sailor shows his bestiality within, as the as uh, as we shall find. Um, and some people can also see this as as a racial bias within the civilized code. O'Neill, you must understand, was certainly not a racist, uh, as as his plays indicate. In Thirst, he only uses a myth that of the black being primitive and savage, but also he is there to say that black or white we are sometimes driven to take extreme measures we are sometimes driven to be to uh, acts of extreme cruelty in order to preserve our in order to um, maintain our life so in this module we have been discussing Eugene O'Neill's life, we have been discussing him as a playwright, but we have been particularly discussing the play The First. Uh, we have learnt about the background of the play, we have learnt about the plot and the summary. And something that you must also therefore keep in mind is when you read the play, please be aware of the fact that this is a play which is written in the classical mold, because this is a play in which we just have three characters, but he uses these three characters to therefore talk, um, uh, to, to express uh, Eugene O'Neill's intention of, of uh, talking about certain primal truths about society. What we also wish to draw our attention to is that uh, by doing this, O'Neill is also perhaps making a comment on the American society at large. He is also trying to remind us that under the veneer of civilization, we are also uh, driven by certain primal instincts. Uh, and please let us not forget that Eugene O'Neill is also writing much of his theatre at a time of great deprivation. There are hungry people, there are thirsty people in America people without jobs. So therefore, if people are driven to such a state of deprivation, then perhaps the veneer of human dignity falls off and we are revealed to be the kind uh, uh, that we are. That is to say, ultimately, it is the survival instinct that triumphs over all others. Thank you.